you've had the kind of a good lockdown in a lot of ways. It's been a productive time for you, yeah. and it's a time when you really um, made the most of uh, outdoors and the environment. I think there's no doubt about that. I think it, it was a great lockdown. Uh, my, mine started uh, a wee bit earlier than most because I was in uh, Loch Callan on the west coast of Scotland writing a book called For the Safety of All, which is here, um, which is all about history of lighthouses, and I couldn't do all of that in Shetland. So I spent a long time there walking, and then I came home, and we went into lockdown. So I spent a long time in that walking, uh, slightly different environment, you know, uh, in the Loch Allen, you know, the, as they say, um, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, the, you know, the Torridon, I think it's a Torridon Hill, you can go to Skye and various other places like that, uh, uh, but, and then I visited a lot of lighthouses too, which sometimes meant a lot of walking, but here it was wonderful, in a curious way, because you were seeing the same thing every day and you were building up a pattern to it and I think that's what inspired me to write. And you were in Cork, you spent most of your time I in Cork and hardly left it for a few months. I did, I, I, Cork, you know, I just, I, I loved walking down, uh, you know, hearing the birds, looking at the things like spiders webs tapping with the clumps of heather, um, seals on the coastline being attacked and mauled by terns, which is one of the great delights of my life. Uh, I thought it was wonderful and, and what I thought it was really is you were building up knowledge of a very small place almost on a daily basis. In a way, you know, we haven't had the opportunity to do so for, deca for decades in the past. And it was it was a lot a lot of time for reflection and yeah. it ended up being productive. It produced the man who talks to birds, yes. a volume of poetry, and you you got on with a lot of other work. work yes, as yeah. so say this this was a tremendous amount of work, and yeah. uh, of all the books I've ever worked in my whole life, this was by far the the most detailed, the most arduous, the most uh, required, uh, and in a sense, the man who talks to birds was my leisure time. Yeah. Uh, when I would go out for a walk and then I would come back and it's amazing what the rhythm of walking itself does to your thinking it, it, yeah. it's a curious way I mean uh, I've often noticed that that if you when you're walking you can if you allow your mind to in a sense break free from you know the, the mundane uh, you know you, uh, you know, worrying about the electricity bills and various other things like that it, there's a rhythm to walking mm. which encourages writing yeah and uh, I would come back with a poem in my head virtually and I would just scratch it down and I did this time and time again yeah I think um, I might ask you to read a few poems yes I think fine. that um, these poems are um, about almost summing up some of your experience and what uh, what you experienced but I think I found some of these quite therapeutic to read the way they focused in on the, the simplicity of nature and, and the environment around you. Well, I'm trying to write, I don't try and aim for complicated words, yeah. I don't aim for yeah. complicated ideas. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is, in a sense, um, be as simple and clear and transparent as I possibly can. Yeah. Uh, nothing fancy, nothing super, you know, hyper yeah. clever. I leave that to others who are much better at that kind of thing than I am. <laughs> <laughs> the, the book's divided into, I suppose, three months, the first part of the book, April, yeah. May and June, the, the time of what was real lockdown. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe uh, can I get you to start with Quarf and Quarantine? Yes. Yeah. Quarf and Quarantine, despite the title, is probably one of the ones that's least inspired by Quarf, because in a sense it was about how uh, I was transported you know, by lockdown, back into my, you know, village life uh, that I experienced as a young lad in a place called South Dell at the tip of Ness and Lewis. And um, we had, it's, you know, 80 acres of croftland about that. We didn't have a car. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
we never really left the village. You know, the, the village boys were the ones I played with, and there was hardly any girls in the village. It was all boys, um, and um, you listened to an awful lot of the old men's stories, and you know, there's references to that in the poem. Quarth in quarantine, twenty twenty. And here we are, transported to our father's age, confined to our eight acres, caged within Croftland, talking across a neighbour's fence in soft rain or sunlight. Soon we'll cross, back into their time, speak of ours, employed on the hydro dams, bringing powers to darken peaks and glens, we call two merchant navy decks years in hotel or service check there's enough feed for every brood of hens pecking around manure heaps knowing we depend on the shit smeared eggs and plucked flesh we harvest from these birds no longer now enmeshed by all that once pressed hard upon us a new birth a new beginning, different, terrifying, fresh. And uh, that new beginning, I think a lot of folk, including yourself, probably m notice most the lack of traffic noise, the lack of the sounds of the modern world, which had a real novelty and, and a real joy. Um, the sounds that you'd be hearing were the same sounds you might have heard in the village a couple yeah, of centuries yeah, ago. Yeah. So rarely you get that chance. Yeah. Could I ask you to read, um, I think it's poems 3A three, uh, three and 3B three in the May section? Yes, uh, these are again kind of, uh, I love terms, I think, uh, you know, particularly because they, uh, they displace my hairline every time I walk, you know, all along, along the, the coast. For a long time I thought the seals had been displaced by returning terns. Imagining these birds soaring up to chase stout intruders from the rocks on which they often lie outstretched. Wings sweeping down to clear them from the crags they hope to pitch their nests. But I was wrong. Today the seals are back to coast and wallow, ignoring too the dark Heads and cries of those that shriek and swirl, claiming sole possession of this edge of their salt world. And number B is, uh, you know, the, the, the one thing you noticed in lockdown was every time you heard a lawnmower or a chainsaw, whatever it might be, it kind of echoed. You actually noticed that more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. particularly in lockdown than you do normally and this day uh, in May there wasn't any lawnmowers heard there weren't any and there was chainsaws or anything else so today the world's untroubled by the sound of engines chainsaws lawnmowers powering over old ground cutting each blade neat and short instead our ears are filled with bird calls, the bickering of gulls, sweep of curlew, the curt interruption of a crow, cheep of starlings, sparrows around our home. We hear cries ebb and flow within a quiet, undisturbed by all man has made for centuries. No stirring or suggestion of a human deed or word. We're just so lucky in Shetland to, to be able to uh, get that kind of um, remoteness, even even out of lockdown. I, um, I, I think there's, that's undoubtedly true. I think yeah. it's, it's one of the great virtues, and particularly, I think, in lockdown. I think lockdown was awful for those in cities. Absolutely. Uh, but if you were prepared to take advantage of your environment, there was something quite magical about it yeah. in Shetland. 
And a lot of us take it for granted far too much, far too, yes, yes. I, I would hope lovely and taught us just how lucky we are. Yes, I think that is. And I think the advantage too of, you know, community, uh, in, in, you know, small, you know, community people helping each other, uh, you know, neighbours helping each other in lockdown came to the fore too. Mm. You know, I think you got that in a lot of small communities you know, around the edge of the, this country, which is great, fantastic. There were many virtues to be found in lockdown, yeah, as well as vices. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying it was all good, but you know, but uh, there were virtues in it as well as vices. Yeah, some more community spirit, some no, some more communication, Commun but yes. also just that freedom to be quite solitary. Uh, some people really relish right. that as yes. well. Yes, I think it, because there's a, there's always a pressure, and I think you know, to be in the company of other people. And I say this as somebody who was a school teacher for how many years uh, and every day was almost like a performance art um, when you would have to go and no matter how you were feeling you know in a sense you know if you're feeling down or fed up or anything you just had to you know put on your best os Oscar winning performance mm -hmm. um, in front of a class of kids and put that to your side. The great thing about lockdown is that you could be yourself in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to go act a part. For um, some people, it was great to get off the treadmill for a, yes, <laughs> a while. Yes, I think yeah. so. You know, I'm, I've always, you know, saw for myself was in some ways an introvert, uh, pretending to be an extrovert. You know, and you know, <coughs> and and probably doing a good job of that pretense most of the time. But what I loved um, about lockdown is it allowed the intro introvert to come to the surface. Uh, and you could notice things uh, much more than usual. You could, you know, yeah. be aware of the, the of the world around you. Yeah, it's that too. Yeah. Can I get you to read the spider's web poem? Yes, this is that's what I think we'll um, folk will recognise that quiet misty morning yes. when you sometimes yes. see all the work of the spider that yeah. is done overnight. No, I, I loved I loved writing this one. I yeah. have to say, you know, I, I remember coming across it and. Uh, edge of a drain and quaff noticing all these yeah. uh, spiders webs today I noticed on my morning walk how cobwebs can lace together heather stalks on still days like these spiders imitating clouds that clamp us down knitting funeral shrouds for insects scrambling around the edges of moor, mimicking that mist we sometimes feel has trapped us in the swithage, having strolled these same roads a thousand times before. That's slightly the more boredom aspect of all that uh, lockdown coming out there. I think I like the way in your book that you did um compare your experience back to how people lived not very long ago, living in small villages, crofts, um, most of their life, hardly leaving. They, yeah. they didn't have the strange life we have nowadays where we're yeah. driving around all over the place, travelling around all over the place, um, feeling that if we didn't do that, we're not very cosmopolitan. Yeah, I think I remember a meeting once the uh, postmaster or the post uh, the, the wom woman who was in charge of the post office in Balavani in Benbecula, you know, it's quite a small island in Benbecula. She had never even gone to North Hewist <laughs> or South yeah. Hewist. Her <laughs> whole life had been like that. And yeah. you know, there were people in my parish, you know, I remember about one of the boys' mothers who had never been to the lighthouse, you know, which is, you know, five or six miles down the road. And you're thinking really strange uh, but th there comes advantages to that too I think yeah. uh, you, um, there were moments when uh, you know there was a mixed feeling you know that you know for instance um, uh, I, I, another thing you remember about living in a small village is how everyone had a pair of binoculars sitting yes. <laughs> <laughs> on their 
windowsill just looking out to what their neighbours were doing, you know. I've got a pair of my windowsills. Oh, well, so do I, but uh, <laughs> I don't use it for that reason anymore. So, you know, I think uh, at that time. So this was, um, I had an uncle who had always, you know, would check out things, you know, in Gaelic. He would ask questions like, Gaelic, she ain't all. Gaelic, she all. Where's he going? Where's she going? With Sometimes I feel I have become someone like my uncle with binoculars upright upon a windowsill, allowing him to take note of all that might occur upon the village road, heat spot, speeding cars, and wonder where they were going in such a hurry, see couples stepping off the bus, the shopping bags they carried, and contemplate the bargains that could be stuffed with him. With me, mostly, is the birds that spin, rise and dip around the shoreline, tankers anchored and still not that far from our garden. They will wait there till lockdown's ended, when oil prices once again might rise, when they will move from here like herring boats once did shifting outwards on a long awaited tide. Thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a real piece about all these poems and you, you were just writing them really for yourself at first. You, you didn't intend to publish a book uh, in these. Uh, what actually happened is I, I, I kind of um, uh, I posted them on Facebook and I noticed I was getting the most extraordinary uh, echoes, people actually really liking them and uh, sharing them amongst themselves. So there were an awful lot of people reading these. And, yeah. uh, and my publisher noticed it too <laughs> and said um, it would be great to publish these, bo these poems you're writing about lockdown because in a sense it's a kind of record of what happened in the kind of rural community during that time, you know, uh, you know, the, within Shetland. And uh, so I said, yeah, okay. Uh, needless to say, I'm not getting paid very much for it. Um, but, you know, it's, if it, you know, you know in, in a sense, um, I always think you're not a writer for yourself. Yeah. Uh, you are a writer for other people. And, you know, um, I think somebody said that to me when I was very, very, uh, it is your job sometimes to give other people voices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, rather than, you know, because there's an awful lot of people who are writers who are unable to speak for themselves. So I, I, that's why I allowed the book to be uh, published. I'm not likely to become a millionaire from it, you know, despite all, uh, <laughs> all, all some people's fantasy lives about how much you get from being a writer. <laughs> It's really good that you did publish it. It's actually a lovely little volume. It's but, um, quite a, um, a very peaceful read. That um, you c to, to just kind of immerse yourself in. You can you can imagine you're walking through Cor. Yes, I know. Yeah. Well, it's like relentlessly walking through Cor sometimes. It, it takes, <laughs> just, just takes yes. you back to that, to that uh, time in a in a good way. Yeah. Um, just in the same theme. Just we were speaking about a few minutes ago about. Um, the, the contrast between people who stay in one place and, and people who are travelling around all over the place and, and doing all kinds of things. Um, there's one, it was written in um, early June, I think. Yes, um, with right. It's about the wisdom of staying put and yeah. that different kind of deep um, yeah. knowledge and, and um, really valuable knowledge you get from staying in one place. Yeah. Whereas it, it tends to be something we sometimes disparage yeah and yet it is it's it's it, uh, to have that kind of in-depth knowledge is, is yeah. wonderful no and that's what I, this one i think has been picked up by other writers mm. so uh, it's it's um you know for instance my um stephen moss who was i think uh, david attenborough's um producer of a lot of his programs uh, of his nature programs uh, pinched this one for his book uh so I mean, I'm, that's great. I, I mean, needless to say, I didn't get paid for that either, but it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 
did that. There are two ways of acquiring wisdom. One, they say, is travelling far and wide. The other is to stay in a location, focusing ears and thoughts and eyes on all that surrounds you in the one place in which you choose or are forced to abide, noting how the seasons slide into each other, the rise and fall of wind or cloud or tide, taking account of changes and allowing them to guide the path on which you step and stride. Someday, though my friends would all deny it, indeed, it would be to their great surprise. I'll have circled all the tracks around this township and discover I am well and truly wise. That's a very unlikely conclusion. But <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, nevertheless. I can think of an awful lot of folk who've not travelled nearly as much as me, but had an awful lot more and wise. <laughs> Well, I think that's uh, that's also true in my case, you know, just to say, and to take that kind of strength from the land, yeah. you know, I think it's just wonderful, you know, you know, yeah. look at, you know, I suppose a lot of the men from my village who, you know, there, there is, there is wisdom sometimes even in being there and watching how families operate and, you know, over generations, you know, that uh, uh, you can miss out on if you're travelling and if you're just too much, uh, all consumed by moving around from one place to another. Yeah. And did you find you were just very much more aware of the seasons and the, yeah. the small changes in light and weather? Well, that's, I mean, it's amazing how, for instance, we had snow this year, you know, quite heavy snow not so long ago, and everyone thought, oh, that's really strange. And now I'm looking at that book and I'm finding, no, we had snow last year and May too. Uh, so, you know, and I think you tend to forget these things. You know, it's almost as if, um, you know, when, you, when you're when you stuck in the one place, you, you know, in a sense, you, uh, you know, events kind of cram up against each other and you forget what happened to you before. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the good things about this book for me is it's a kind of a reminder. Yes, we had snow last year. We had great snow. <laughs> Some people, some people give weather diaries. Uh, well, I, I haven't gone to that, but I can see the, the attraction of that yeah. too. Yes, it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, to do that. Be a lighthouse keeper like the ones in old book. They had to keep a, yeah. an eye on the coming train for the, <laughs> you know, you know how many hours of sunshine, etc. Et yeah. yeah. So, as well as wandering around Quarf, you weren't just. Um, wandering around reflecting and no. contemplating you were actually really busy did you you i mean really you had i think two books that yes. very much you had time to work on and yes. and you were really productive yeah. during that time so i guess was it was that aided by the time you had to be out, to go out and um see the outside world and contemplate i think you know the, in a sense you are you know in normal life you are forced sometimes to be social. Yeah. Go out and see people. Uh, what was good about, certainly for a writer, is this was a time when you were forced not to be sociable. Uh, so you could just get on with it. So I wrote the, the novel Layer, which is um, In a Veil of Mist, which is about an incident that took place in 1952, was based around an incident that took place in 1952 when the people. Uh, from the other opposite end side of the island from me where uh, they had chemical tests well, biological weapon testing going on in the, uh, off the coastline so that was one book and then uh, this um, this was a, as I say an epic work uh, lots of wonderful wonderful photos diagrams this is the proof, is the proof, is the proof copy proof of your lighthouse book. Notebook, yeah and as I say uh, I'm not saying this for my own benefit, but <laughs> I have to say it is one of the most, you know, wonderfully illustrated books I've ever seen in my life. And, uh, Fantastic illustrations. Um, just, you know, the, the whole whole thing has just been, it's been, uh, it was a wonderful book to write on, and, uh, to write. 
It was yeah. an awful lot of work. <laughs> uh, of all books I've ever written, this was undoubtedly the most hard work. Yeah. Because uh, there are people who are fanatical about lighthouses. Yeah. So you have to be careful uh, that you made no mistakes. And so in some cases, you know, this work has been edited and double edited and triple ed edited. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's been a lot of work, but it's, it's, it's and you know, as I say, it's just a thing of beauty. Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I look at it. When's it uh, being published? Uh, at the end of July. Sweet, good. Uh, so mm -hmm. the 29th of July. Yeah. And uh, but we're we're just about there now. But thankfully, there goes the time for that very frustrating life. Yeah. Are you s you've you've been a teacher, of course, again? Yes. And are yeah. you are you sinking back into the habit of not going out walking enough? <sighs> no, because I have a dog, uh, yeah. and uh, the dog forces me to go out every day. <laughs> um, I, I, it would be very easy to get back into that habit. Yeah. I, but I also feel, in, in a sense, you know, writing is very. I think sometimes, um, I think, I, I don't think this is exclusively about writing. I think, uh, in one way, of solving the problems in your life or in your work, as it might be is in a sense to allow yourself to get distracted from that work yeah. uh, and going out for a walk um, is a way of dealing of doing that you know um, and I think you know it's so easy to become obsessed with what we do you know to earn a living um, that sometimes we forget that that yeah. fact it actually helps you it's a great way of solving problems is to distract yourself yeah. and I think in Shetland a lot of us are because there's not a lot of cars um, yes. a lot of us are guilty of just getting Shopping. in the car going to work or wherever getting back in the car going home you hardly walk at all if you're not careful and you, you sometimes have to make space for it yeah and I think sometimes the weather you know at yeah. certain times of the year actually adds to that yeah. you know there are days when you cannot yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, you know. Go out for a walk without in danger of being taken off and landing in Norway somewhere. Yeah. You know, which uh, you know is is, <laughs> is an issue. Um, so I do think it's really important to walk here and, and you yeah. know to have uh, as as you know many opportunities as you can. Sometimes you see people <laughs> who are feeling they have to walk for the good of their health, yeah. but they're kind of grimly doing yeah. it as a duty and <laughs> maybe listening to the headphones as they yes. go and, and marching along and I think what your your poems illustrated that it really gives you a, I, don't know, I don't know if you'd even call it a kind of mindfulness opportunity if you're yeah. really noticing the colours and the sounds, everything the feel, the weather, the feel of the air yeah. it's it's much more than just moving your feet in front of each yeah. other to get somewhere I, you know I, I, I often say to the classes I teach, uh, you know, um, I think you can sit down and do mathematics and have music on in the background. Yeah. I think you can even read and have music on in the background. Yeah. But if you're serious about writing, you cannot have music on the background uh, because uh, um, language has its own rhythms. Yeah. And if you don't listen to these rhythms, then you know, you're all over the place in terms of your writing. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I mean, I listen to music, you know, quite a lot in the car, I listen, listen to music when I relax. I, I don't ever listen to music when I'm writing. Yeah, ah, that's interesting, that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. yeah, because I do think there's a rhythm to language and, and yeah. you, you can so easily lose it yeah. if you're listening to the rhythm. I think I'll get you to read another poem. <laughs> I, I, I think um, there's, there's um, the poems, the, some of these poems, there's, um, there's ones that just really just um, sum up the, uh, show how you notice the colours and the sounds and everything around you so much. Yeah, um, one thing you notice when you were walking was the differences in shades and even small things you wouldn't normal, normally use. Uh, Quartz, of course, is home to the rare monkey flowers did you know that 
monkey fur. No. It's a monkey fur you find in, I think it's only found in Quart and Shetland. I kind of believe I did the king. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, I, I found it, uh, I, I think I, I read that somewhere, and I, I can actually see the monkey flower, as I, uh, you know, particularly in June. You can see it as oh. brightest in June. Yeah. Uh, so, if any of you fancy watching, you know, going to see what a monkey flower looks like, um, go to Quart for that. Behind our house, bog cotton white in the peat dark ground, star and comet bright shining when both rain and cloud grind earth loft spirits down. And then a twist of road, a slow swerve round a corner, flakes of sun are found within a field of buttercups in a sodden stretch of ground with glints of tormentor, a rare monkey flower, the blackbird's yellow beak pecking at the greenness of our mood with its yet mellow range of sounds. They used to use tormentor, the roots of tormentor, to make a kind of version of tea at one time. Oh, right. Yeah, I love Donald. Yes. Can I get you, Donald, to read the one about the raid shank in the mist as well? Yeah. I'm not sure if, why I like this one so much. It's just peace and um, yeah. colour and uh, the, um, just ju just just uh, the contem the quietness and contemplation of the, the walks around Quart and noticing things, I suppose. I think it just sums up a lot of what I, I, yeah. I enjoy, enjoy about the yeah. book. It's, no, as I say, I love red shanks. I think you know, it, it is, uh, there's lots of lapwings. I love you know, uh, um, oyster catchers, which have got a very interesting name in Gaelic, the Gila Bridge, you know, Bridget's men, you know, the, 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 um, which I go into in the book. Um, but I love that there's something about red shank that's got quite a lot of personality to it. Today, everything's transformed. The fleece of sheep mingling with cloud, waves rippling on the beach, bearing a similar shade, when all is quiet and hush, land and sea impossible to make out or distinguish. Within that blur of greyness the red shank struts. We glimpse it on a fence post, how that small head juts back and forth as it takes time to probe the world around it, both dark shade and tiny sign of light until the damp gloom of the hours altered by its dance, the purr of thin legs kicking, a flash of scarlet stockings rising from the land to give all who watch it impressions of the Moulin Rouge or Cayley dance with imitations of a jig or reel, the high jinks of the can-can. So, um, yeah, the idea of the can-can being danced, I'm sure, like, <laughs> in Shetland, is, is, <laughs> doesn't happen very often. Can-can. <laughs> 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 it's quite hard to say, I think. Uh, it's, it's, a year now, a year now since this extraordinary time. Yes. Um, it's probably changed us all in one way or another. Yes. Um, I think you took a lot of positives out of it. Yes, I think there's no doubt. I think, and, and I think in a way, it, it made me feel like much more at ease with myself. Um, and you know, because I had spent, as I say, the previous year doing an awful lot of book festivals and talking about a very you know, traumatic event, you know, 208 people died on my native island. That was your book about the island, That yeah. island, yeah, book. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was, and, you know, some of the questions you would get at book festivals were <laughs> absolutely um, terrifying. You know, you would, you know, people actually asking questions at the upper fan, uh, questions about um, the trauma of the violence in Northern Ireland and how that affected people. People asking you about personal traumas in front of an audience of 
sometimes quite a large audience in front of you so there'll be about 100 people in front of you and you're having to ask question, answer questions which frankly you know I find very difficult how does a place get over the brain I don't know what happened to the mm-hmm. brain how does a place get over you know over the, the you know the trauma of violence in, in Northern Ireland um and I, you know, I think one of the ways you get over it is in a curious way is by writing, perhaps about it, mm. uh, by contemplating it, by not hiding away, by talking about it, by not locking it away within yourself, uh, by two doing what I did, which was you know going out for long walks, uh, is another way of doing it. Um, so this was a final. This was about uh, an awful lot. I can't remember the figures he, he, he gives, but an awful lot of migra- migrating birds are killed while migrating. I think seven out of ten of them is really high. It's it's extremely high. Um, uh, that um, it's surprisingly high, you know, they, they, and and the number of ways they are killed. So you know. Whereas birds that settled in one place, like our local starlings or sparrows, are much less likely, you know, <laughs> to be killed, uh, you know, for that, and for that reason. So this was uh, one good reason to remain in lockdown. It was inspired by a novel um, by Colin McCann, which I'm not going to pronounce the title of because I'm not sure I know how to pronounce it. But it was it's about. Israel and this and Palestine and, and I thought it was really a, a, a really I, mean, I, I love his work I think he's one of the most interesting novelists around um, so this is called one good reason to remain in lockdown one good reason to remain in lockdown it is safer to stay still migrating birds are often killed by everyday obstacles such as steel pylons the chill of unexpected snowfall, high windows, crops that either rot or fail, sandstorms, occasional oil spills, poison, overflowing drains, a jagged, rusty nail. All reasons why it's wiser to remain like the blackbird, starling, sparrow, Birds that rise and dip, gorge and peck their fill among the trees that grow just beyond the space where I write outside my window sill. Thank you, Donald. Uh, thank you so much. It's been lovely oh, speaking to you. Nice. And um, just a year later, I'm thinking a lot of the migrating birds are coming back. I yes. feel like our, fr- our friends from I'm this time last exactly year are coming that, back. Yes. So I'm going to try not to contemplate the fact that a lot of them have actually been killed yeah. and aren't yeah. coming back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's so beautiful to see them all oh, back. Oh, it is wonderful. To see and it. I think, it's yeah, I think I noticed them more because they were uh, there for us last, last summer. Yeah. Last, yes. uh, yeah. so, um, thanks very much for talking about your experience and your writing and um, both the the man who talks to birds this short book of poems plus the fact that you you know you've produced <laughs> so yeah. much more the veil of mist and the proof copy now of the lighthouse book coming yeah. up and so it's um it's amazing how much you've you've um produced and how much you've you've used this time in a positive way and i'd like to thank by the way shetland library for uh callan and and the staff at shetland library uh Thank you, Donald. Thank you.